Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce our first EndNote speaker, Dr. Catrice Albert. Dr. Albert is Vice President for Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota. She leads the University of Minnesota's diversity goals across five campuses statewide and is very active in diversity inclusion organizations across the community. She serves on the board of directors for the Penumbra Theater and is part of the Governor's Diversity and Inclusion Council and the Governor's Young Women's Initiative Council. Additionally, she is a member of the Generation Next Leadership Council and the Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable. Previously, she served on the Board of Directors for Volunteers of America, both on the national level and Minnesota and Wisconsin. Prior to joining the University of Minnesota, Dr. Albers served for eight years as a Chief Diversity Officer at Louisiana State University. She is the co-editor of two volumes, Trayvon Martin, Race and Ju American Justice, Writing Wrong, published in 2014, and Racial Battle Fatigue in Higher Education, Exposing the Myth of Post-Racial America, published in 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Catrice Albert. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for allowing me to be here um, at your fourth annual leadership uh, conference and forum. I'm just delighted to be with you all this afternoon. And I know we come from different sectors, and while I might not be able to speak to the things that you um, deal with on an everyday basis, we do have some common ground. We have very similar values, especially around working in partnership and being accountable to one another. One of my favorite quotes is an African proverb, and it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So it seems like a lot of people uh, that I've talked to in this room, we have a lot uh, to be um, conscious of about being in relationship in order to transform and impact our communities. And it's great to see the themes that you all have been able to um, struggle and challenge yourselves with today around emotional intelligence and creating championship cultures. And our office uh, at the University of Minnesota around equity and diversity, we have some of the same concepts uh, and we challenge ourselves that it's really essential to really hone into these concepts, especially emotional intelligence, when you're trying to drive inclusive excellence. So I think we share those values and those goals. And um, as you think about your own leadership traje trajectory, those are the essential qualities that will really get you into a professional narrative. I've always felt that the function of leadership is uh, to support passionate a action while asking compelling questions. And I know that you all have done that today. So I hope that what I talk about today will sort of coalesce all the things that, that you have learned and the things that you've challenged your colleagues about. Um, so when I was 16 years old, uh, my parents sat me down and said, we have something to tell you. And if OMG was popular back then. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. So they announced to me that we were expecting. And I said, expecting what? <laughs> well, we're expecting a baby. And I said, well, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm 16 years old. I'm going to college next year. How did y'all let this happen? Um, I don't want to be a part of these shenanigans. <laughs> so my brother Philip was born my senior year, and so they really did continuous parenting. And so while I was away being educated, I stayed connected to him as a little boy, literally, through letters and cards and trinkets like Pokemon car cards and, you know, little Hot Wheels and things that made him, you know, tr try to connect with this very much older sister that was in college. And so when I returned back home to the state of Louisiana to take the job at LSU, well, then I was present. So I was going to his music events and his 
baseball games and things like that. And so I just stopped all of the mailing of things. And he said to me, you know, you stopped mailing me those letters and those cards. Um, I said, yeah, because I'm home. And he said, well, you know, that those things mattered. They really, really mattered. So I recount this story to you about my parents kind of losing their minds and acting like they were, they were young again. Um, <laughs> and having a younger brother that's 16 years younger than me. And I recount this because I want you to know that emotional intelligence matters, your leadership trajectory that matters, the things that you're doing to try and be thoughtful about how we connect with one another so that we might be able to advance our communities. Those things really matter. Um, this conversation around game changers, and I know that I'm what stands between you and the great words of Representative Moran, so I won't take a lot of your time, but I do want to just share with you a few game changer principles that you've probably heard from the leaders that you've had today, because these game changing principles matter to me. Game changers know their leadership style, and I, if I could be so bold as to encourage you to think about a principle-based leadership style, one that lets you sleep at night, right? That you make the right decisions all the time because Dr. Martin Luther King said it's always the right time to do the right thing. If I may be so bold as to encourage you to think about being a servant-based leader, one who understands that we always are in service of others. Marian Wright Edelman says, service is the, pay, the rent that we pay for simply living. And finally, I ask that you think about being a transformational leader, like, you know, doing the things that you have to do today, but thinking about five years from now, I think it was Wayne Gretzky's dad who talked about the difference between a good and a great hockey player, right? He said a good hockey player skates to where the puck is. A great hockey player skates to where the puck is gonna be. So be thoughtful about your leadership style. That can be a game changer. Game changers understand that there is really no room for error. I encourage you to think about not only excellence, but doing things at the, at the standard of platinum, that your work is flawless, that you're a national thought leader on things like how do we really drive inclusive excellence and diversity and interculturalism in the, in the military and in the National Guard. I, I surmise that it is very important that leaders communicate what they know. I want you to really be thoughtful about being a game changer around intercultural competence. And what do I mean when I say that you had a lovely panel from the governor's office earlier, but Paul Peterson is one of our leading experts on intercultural competence, and he suggests that we have to be aware of our attitudes. We have to have significant knowledge around this, and we have to let others know that we can connect with them even when we're not mirror images. It's easier to be connected to someone who looks exactly like you and shares a lot of the same demographic data. But leaders really challenge themselves around connecting with those who don't look like them. I want to challenge you because game changers understand that diversity is really a part of the bottom line. And so many of these executives who have written to you in your packets talking about their leadership experience, they also know it's a part of the bottom line. Continued racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, heterosexism is at a fever pitch right now in our country. And we've got to do our part to show that we've got to be connected because we get nowhere alone. I want you to understand that game changers chart their own courses. And I know that everyone in this room can appreciate that when I was um, a, an undergraduate student at Xavier, I shared, um, well, I had to have a roommate. There was no choice at this little Catholic school. Even if you wanted a single, there was, there was none to be had. And I shared this room with one of my dearest friends today and her mother uh, in this thick Cameroonian accent would always tell me that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is right now.
So you chart your own course. You don't wait for things to happen. After I graduated from Xavier, I borrowed my grandmother's car because my car couldn't make it to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, only two and a half hours away. And I went and I applied for um, what we call graduate assistantships. Many of you may have had those um, studying for your master's degree where they pay for your schooling and you get a little stipend. And I interviewed at the Career Center in Student Affairs and in Housing. I hadn't been um, admitted to the program yet. But there was faith. I knew I was gonna be admitted, I just needed to make sure that I had a job when I got there. So game changers chart their own course. Before I sit down, I want to give, leave you with one last game changer, and that is that you have radical self-care. Working in partnerships or working alone, doing the work that impacts communities, it's very hard, it's not easy work. Doing diversity work is not easy work. And I have a colleague here in the Twin Cities, uh, Dr. Joy Lewis, and she talks about radical self-care because we know so many people, our own friends, our colleagues, that have given so much of themselves and their narrative is that they did so much for other people that they were very busy, focused, outward that they didn't have an ethos of self-care. So what I want to suggest to you is that game changers practice radical self-care because what we don't want is burnout. And you all are so young and spry. We need all of your brilliance for as long as we possibly can have it. So she says radical self-care is about the four M's, meditation, mindful eating, conscious movement with a capital M, and emotional liberation. So what that means is that you've got to be conscientious about yourself and what it takes to feel good. Um, at the beginning of um, the, the, the um, summer session, uh, one of my friends talked me into doing the couch to 5K. So I'm not athletic like you all in this room, I can assure you. I'm not athletic like any of the uh, athletic personnel that talked to you earlier, but I got myself a Fitbit, and so she says, it's gonna be really easy, we're gonna do this. She also inspired me to start hot yoga. <laughs> okay, so I'm a girl from South Louisiana, I know about heat and humidity, I've just never experienced 120 degrees in a very small compact room. But those two things just really gave me more endurance. It, gave, it made me feel more alive. I got to work and I'm like, oh, you know, all of the neurons really are firing. So this self-care is really important. Radical self-care is when you put yourself on your own list. So I hope that um, something that I've said in these end notes around um, your commitment to your own leadership narrative that includes emotional intelligence and being a game changer, uh, I hope that it mattered. I hope that you can rem remember that I have a brother that's 16 years younger than me and talks to me uh, as millennials do about like the craziest things like, well, Catrice, why don't you get a Maserati that when you turn in your Toyota? I'm like, okay, this is what it means to have a, a younger brother with no siblings in between us. We talk about really, really interesting things. Um, I also want to leave you with one final note, and that is something that I heard from Sin Delaney. And when they came in to do a leadership exercise uh, to help transform organizations, they talked about always being in choice with our own habits. So today, I hope that you are in choice in the progress of your own leadership development. I hope that you're in progress and in choice around using the emotional intelligence that you have and challenging yourselves on those emotional intelligent trends that you need. Make every day your best day, for as my younger brother Philip says, it really, really matters. Good afternoon.
Thank you, Dr. Albert. We would like to present, present to you at this time an award on behalf of our planning team and the Minnesota National Guard. I'm coming to you, okay. Yep. Oh, and for a photograph, I gotta <laughs> right. put all of that down. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was an honor to have you here today. Please accept this desktop plaque and certificate of appreciation as a token of our thanks for your time and dedication to enhancing emotional intelligence and strengthening the leaders of the Minnesota National Guard, presented by Lieutenant Colonel Merricks. We are grateful for your presence here today and for your invaluable contributions to today's event. Thank you. 